So today we're going to talk about sort of the next level of complexity in terms of GYN brachytherapy, and that is tandem and ovoid insertion, simulation, treatment planning, and delivery. So we're going to try and follow sort of the same format as yesterday, and we'll walk through all of those different steps. I can advance the slides. So we'll start with an overview of what a tandem and ovoid is. I know you talked a little bit about this, Dan Skanderbeg, last week, but I just wanted to go over that again in case uh, anyone wasn't on that last presentation. We'll talk about uh, commissioning, just like we did yesterday. It's actually a very similar process. Insertion. Patient transport, which is something <clears throat> that we didn't talk about yesterday, but it's very important for tandem and ovoid treatments. Imaging, where imaging was optional yesterday for cylinders because we were using pre-planned plans. For tandem and ovoids, imaging is a necessity. The reason for that is uh, the tandem and ovoid does not have a fixed geometry, so we can't really use pre-plans with the tandem and ovoid. So we need to image for every single fraction, image and digitize the applicator. Uh, and then we'll talk also about planning aims and prescription. So really what we're looking to treat, if you look at this image on the right, we have the vagina, the cervix, and the uterus. And really our target area is gonna be right at the cervix. So we're also gonna treat the, the uterus, but our really important high-risk CTV area or high-risk of recurrence area is really the cervix. So we can think of using tandem and ovoids really to treat the, to treat the cervix. Here's what a tandem and ovoid looks like. So we have one central channel. If you look at the image on the far right, we have one central channel that runs down the middle and then typically curves up to match the anatomy of the uterus. <coughs> You can have different lengths of that tandem. You can have different curvatures of that tandem, different degrees of angle to that tandem. And then on, the, on either side of that tandem, we have what are called ovoids. And if we just advance the slide here, you can see what an actual tandem and ovoid looks like, not just in the schematic. So if you look at the image on the left, you have the central channel running along the bottom of the applicator. It passes through the middle of the two ovoids, which are these cylindrical, plastic cylindrical blocks, and then curves up into the uterus. And the strategy for this is going to be to insert the tandem through the cervix into the uterus, and then have these two ovoid channels, a right and a left ovoid, just adjacent to the cervix. And so what that allows us to do is to generate what I think Dan also talked about a little bit is this sort of pear-shaped distribution. So whenever we think about what the isodose lines are going to look like for both a tandem and ovoid and a tandem and ring, which Dan is going to talk to you about next week, we want to have this idea that the 100% isodose line in this image uh, represented by the thicker yellow line is going to be in the shape of a pear. And the reason for that is because we have this one central channel where we're getting dose all the way up to the thin part of the pear, the top of the pear, and then as we come, as we move <coughs> down through the cervix, we have dose coming from the ovoids here that's pushing the dose out to the wider part of the pear. So it, it's actually a pretty useful safety tool to have this image in your mind. And one of the things I do before we deliver any of these treatments is to just very generally look through this dose distribution and see if it does have this typical pear shape. So that's something you wanna be thinking about always uh, for both tandem and ovoids uh, and tandem and ring treatments. So as we said previously, primarily we're using this to treat in, intact cervical cancer. So patients have not had a hysterectomy. We're also gonna treat part of the uterus. The goal is to treat cervix and uterus. Commissioning this is essentially the same as what we did yesterday, what we talked about yesterday for cylinders. The, the most important thing for us to do in terms of commissioning specific for tandem and ovoids 
is to ensure that our planned and delivered lengths match. So we want to know that, let's say we have a, a length of 150. We want to know that when we put in the treatment planning system, deliver X number of dwell positions at 150 centimeters length, we want to know that that actually reaches the spot on the tandem that we think it is. So if, 100, if our total length is 150, then we want to know that that's the end of the tandem or the end of the ovoids. So the easiest way for us to do that is to use gaff chromic film because we don't need to do any developing, but it is also possible to use standard film and then develop it. The feedback is just not real time. <clears throat> so we're going to tape the tandem and two ovoid catheters on gaff chromic film. Again, we're not going to use those plastic pieces for the ovoids. We're just going to use the, the central channels. Tape those on a piece of gaff chromic film. Just like we did yesterday, deliver 10 to 15 seconds in each of 20 dwell positions. So we get something like a six, uh, six centimeter length, uh, depending on your manufacturer and depending on how your system is set up. And then exactly the same as yesterday. So if we pretend that we have a piece of gap chromic film in the top left of that image, we're gonna tape our applicators onto that film and then deliver our treatment with our planned lengths. And what we would like to see is that dose distribution exact, exactly matching where our tandem is taped on the gaff chromic film. If it does, we're happy with it. If we had set it up like this, and this was our resulting dose distribution, then that, that would certainly not be good, right? Because we're not reaching the tip of the channel. So in that case, we would know that something is wrong. But if we can reproduce it in the same way that we did here, that's what we're really looking for, matching that dose distribution on the gaff chromic or regular film to the position of the tandem on or ovoids on that film. Okay, so that's, that's an important point. And it's, it's really a very, very easy test. All you need is either gaff chromic film or regular film. Insertion. <clears throat> so again, the, if you look at the image on the right, uh, we find the cervix here, it's in the, right in between the vagina and the uterus. Um, and the tandem is inserted through the vagina, through the cervical os, and into the uterus. And you can see this is why we have um, that angle on the tandem, because it matches the angle uh, of the uterus. We have different lengths of tandem, because we see different lengths of uterus. And we also have different angles, because depending on specific patient anatomy, we could um, benefit from having much uh, higher angle or a much lower angle. And then ovoids are placed on the outside of the cervix, lateral to the tandem. One important point to remember, just like we did yesterday for the cylinder, we wanna use the largest possible ovoids. Does anyone have any idea why we wanna use as large as possible ovoids? So yesterday we wanted to use uh, as large as possible cylinder essentially to avoid air gaps between the vaginal wall and the cylinder. In this case, it's a little bit different. The reason we want to use <clears throat> larger ovoids, as large as possible ovoids in a tandem and ovoid insertion is because that moves the tissue away from the central catheter in the ovoids. And that allows us to get more dose laterally while reducing hot spots. So if we had, if we use really small ovoids, then we wouldn't push the tissue very far away from where our dwell positions are, and we would end up getting very, very too much dose in the nearby tissue. But if we use larger ovoids, then because of the inverse square law, we can get dose further lateral without those hot spots. So, as a general rule, we always want to use the largest ovoids possible. And again, this is going to depend on anatomy. Every tandem and ovoid kit uh, is going to come with different lengths of tandems, different angles of tandems, and also different sizes of ovoids. So you can choose that at the time of the insertion. This is what the insertion is going to look like on CT imaging. This is a sagittal plane. So we have the bladder 
in yellow, uh, the sigmoid or bowel in blue, and the rectum in brown, and the high-risk CTV in red. And so this is the area we're going to be most interested in treating. And we've chosen the slice here to run immediately down the center of the tandem. So that's what the tandem is going to look like when it's inserted. You can see it's got this um, widening portion here just under the high-risk CTV, which we call the flange. And that's going to sit just on the outside of the cervix, again, which is essentially represented by this red volume here, which is what we call the high-risk CTV. Here's what it's going to look like in a coronal image. <clears throat> so again, we have the tandem running through the cervical os. We have the flange of the tandem right here running through the cervical os into the uterus. And on either side of that, laterally, we have a right ovoid and a left ovoid. And you can see the central um, channel of that, those ovoids, as well as the plastic cylinders or ovoids on those images. Okay, an important point here, and it, in my experience, different ph physicians do this a little bit with some variability, uh, but very important part of this insertion, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, where does the tandem go and where do the ovoids go? And this is all great, but one way we can really, really improve the implant for a number of different reasons is to use packing. And this is essentially just gauze. <coughs> we use gauze that has metallic wire in it so we can see it on CT. And if you look at the image on the right, again, we have the flange, which is this widening portion of the tandem right underneath the HRCTV. And then if you follow the tandem out of the patient, between the tandem and the rectum, you have this sort of wire, uh, wire mesh gauze. And can be really, really valuable, primarily for the reason that it pushes the rectum out of the way. And this is, can greatly affect the quality of the implant. If we didn't have any gauze between the tandem and the rectum, the rectum might be right up against the tandem and it would have a very hard time delivering the required dose to the HRCTV. But by simply just packing some gauze uh, between the tandem and the rectum, we can physically push it out of the way and that allows us to get a much better dose distribution in the HRCTV. So really important, people don't often think about it because you're doing the tandem, you're doing the ovoid. Those are kind of the things that everybody's concentrating on. But in my experience, packing, uh, someone who does really, really good packing gets much better dose distributions. And we actually use a lot of packing. And there's another reason we use packing. It's that it stops the tandem and ovoids from moving, which is also really essential in this, in this treatment technique. And I'll get to that. Uh, and Derek, yes. Um, I think this is a perfect time. George from Sweden Ghana Medical Center in Ghana asked a question sh regarding the dose distribution. Should it always be pear-shaped, taking into account the given HRCTV and some OARs closer to the applicators? And I think your comment about using the gauze to push the OERs away is, is a, a helpful insight. Yes, I think, you know, I would say yes. The dose distribution should always be pear-shaped. It should not always be exactly the same, but it should always be pear-shaped. You're always going to have dose coming from the ovoids, and you're always going to have dose coming from the tandem. And any, anytime you have that set up, you're going to have this pear shape. There's, a, there's another, the reason I like to look at that pear shape, um, let me just go to a slide where I can, I can't use my keyboard. Let me just go back to that distribution. So one of, one of the reasons I, I really like this <clears throat> as, a safety, as a safety tool is because it can be quite easy to load the tandem below the ovoids. And this is something we definitely load 
the tandem ever outside of the cervix. And sometimes we do that by mistake. And what happens then, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but what happens then, Ben, can you see my mouse? Uh, yes. You can, okay, perfect. So if we loaded by mistake, if we loaded the tandem lower than we should have, then what that does is push the dose distribution down like this, and it, it sort of no longer looks like a pair. And sometimes we see that and we think, oh, I realize what we've done, we've loaded the tandem too low. So it's a great, uh, great sort of safety tool. But to answer the question more directly, in general, we're, we're always looking for this sort of pear shape. Sometimes, depending on the HRCTV, we might have sort of a larger bulge out on one side. So it's not always exactly symmetrical. It's not always exactly the same, but it should always be pear-shaped. Does that help, George? Okay. Sorry, I'm just reading through the questions here. So uh, Michael Tesoto asked a question, do you think gauze is a physician's preference over a rectal paddle? Have you used a clamp for external mobilization for the applicator? Yeah, so I'm just getting to external mobilization for the, for the applicator for sure. That, that's a great question. I think it is physician's preference. My personal preference is to use gauze because I think it does a lot better job of immobilizing the tandem intern with respect to the internal anatomy than an external than just an external clamp with with a paddle. But that's that's just my experience. I know some physicians will just use a paddle and an external clamp. I like to use if, if I had my way, if I was always making the decision on that, I would use gauze and an external clamp because I really feel like the gauze uh, does a good job, just to, to say the same thing again, does a really good job of holding the tandem in place with respect to the internal anatomy of the patient, which is the most important thing uh, for us. And we'll see why that's the case in just a minute. Michael, did you want to add to that? Yeah, okay, I just saw your message. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions, everybody. This is great. Maybe I wasn't using the chat function yesterday to see the questions. And if that's the case, I really apologize. So another question from Deepak. What should be the bladder, rectum, and bowel protocol for a better outcome? So we actually have, I think this question might be about dose tolerances. And we have some fairly well-defined dose tolerances for bladder, rectum, and bowel. Most of those dose tolerances are going to be the dose to the, the highest 2cc volume dose for each one of those organs. And we have a spreadsheet that allows you to track that, including your external beam dose and the dose that each of those organs get from each of the fractions. So we can have uh, we can have a look at that, but it is it's it is well defined, and we will get to that later on. If not in this presentation, then definitely in John Ike's presentation in a few weeks. But it is a great point that we're going to have to manipulate the shape of this pair dose distribution in order to meet those dose tolerances for bladder, uh, rectum, and bowel. So that's primarily, and it's always going to be an optimization between getting enough dose in the HRC TV and avoiding the bladder, rectum, and bowel. That's all. That's always the compromising optimization problem in tandem and opioids. Oh, right. Okay. So Deepak is actually asking about bladder rectal filling protocols. So at our institution, we don't do any rectal filling. In fact, it's usually best for us if we have the, the rectum completely empty. Bladder filling, again, is sort of a physician's preference. I don't have a huge preference for that. For some patients, it can be beneficial to fill the bladder in an effort to move the bowel away from where we're trying to treat. But 
I think that is uh, very dependent on patient anatomy. So we do use that technique, but probably only in about 25% of our patients will we do bladder filling. And again, the reason to do that is to move the bowel away from the place where we're trying to treat. Our protocol for that also depends on the size of the, the bladder, the ability of the patient to tolerate the sensation of having a full bladder, anywhere from 100 to 150 cc's of bladder filling would be typical for us. One of the reasons I'm not a huge fan of it is that typically what we would do is fill the bladder, image the patient, and then re release the bladder fill while we digitize and plan and measure the lengths just so the patient can be more comfortable. But when we do that, we need to remember to refill the bladder before treatment. And given that it's can be sort of a chaotic environment, that's a very easy thing um, to forget. In which case, your, the plan that you deliver um, is not the plan that you had planned. So from my perspective, if we can avoid using bladder filling, then we're in a safer space. But for some patients, it, it certainly does result in, a, in more optimized dose distribution. Just very important to remember that you have to refill the bladder. Does that make sense, Deepak? Uh, yes. Great. Okay. Let me see where we are here. I think we're here. Oh, goodness. Okay, so as we said previously here, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna close the chat. Ben, maybe if so, uh, something comes up, can you just let me know? Yeah, absolutely, that's why I'm here. Great, thanks, Ben. So as I said at the start of the presentation, imaging for tandem and ovoids is not optional at all. So we're gonna have to image every single one of our fractions, which definitely adds complexity. And one of the reasons it adds complexity, there are many reasons that it adds complexity, but one of the reasons that it adds complexity is we need to think about moving our patient from wherever we do the insertion onto the CT table. And typically we're gonna do our imaging with CT scanner. And if we're moving the patient from where we did the insertion to the CT scanner, at some point we're going to have to transfer the patient with um, the tandem ovoid implanted from that table onto the CT table. So that's going to involve potentially quite a bit of patient motion. And that's something that we want to avoid um, as much as possible. So we take uh, great care Actually, not so much transferring the patient from the surgical bed to the CT scanner, but we take a huge amount of care transferring the patient from the CT scanner back to the surgical bed. And the reason for that is once we acquire those CT images, we're going to base everything that we do on those CT images. So we want as much as possible to ensure that the tandem and ovoid stay in the same position as they are when we image the patient. Because if we image the patient with the tandem ovoid in one position, and then when we're transferring the patient back to the bed, or if something happens, uh, once the patient is back in the surgical bed, then we're going to deliver uh, definitely a suboptimal treatment. So we do everything we can to ensure that transferring the patient from the CT table back to the surgical bed, <clears throat> we don't have any, any movement at all. And that's one of the reasons, again, I really like the use of this packing. As uh, Michael mentioned earlier, I'm not sure I have it on here. Yeah, that's something I should have included. Oh yeah, okay, so we, we, I do have it included here, but I didn't mention it. Exterior to the patient, the tandem and ovoid catheters come out of the patient. We also use an external fluid. And this is essentially just like, it's like a vice, a vice that you would have in a, in a, in a working shop. And the tandem in place 
relative to the bed. So the combination of having gauze inside the patient hold the candle to the holding the tandem. Um, hey, Deepak, can you please uh, mute your microphone? Thanks very much. Um, holding the tandem in place with respect uh, to the bed is a really good sort of stable immobilization practice for uh, tandem and ovoids. Okay, the imaging is not optional. We're definitely going to want to have a CT scan in order to plan these. 2.5 millimeter slice thickness is sufficient, but typically we're gonna want as small slices as possible because that's gonna make it easier for us to do our digitization. Digitizing the tandem and ovoids, again, a really important part of the treatment. If you get the digitization incorrect, then the planned delivery is gonna be incorrect. I think everybody understands that. So this is something that you wanna take your time at. And I would actually advocate that you want to develop for yourself a recipe that makes sense to you for doing this and then to use that recipe every time and practice using that recipe until you can do it really quickly because time is of the essence for these treatments and really accurately because accuracy is also of, of, of the essence here. So just to give you <coughs> some sort of idea in your mind about the need for accuracy here. If we're talking about a single dwell position, two centimeters away from a point of interest, okay, a single dwell position, two centimeters away from a point of interest, half a millimeter error in delivery accuracy leads to about a 10% error in dose distribution. Okay, we're really close to the sources, so inverse square is playing a huge role so again, let me just say that at a point two centimeters away from a single source, if we get that source position incorrect by half a millimeter, we're looking at approximately a 10% error in dose distribution. Okay, for our treatments, this is not the case because we're not using a single dose distribution. So that error sort of washes out quite a bit. But the need for accuracy is clear given that example. So it, again, I, I'm just going to spend some time <laughs> repeating this. You really want to develop a strategy, sorry, a recipe that works for you. And then every time you sit down to do a digit, digitization, you just bang, 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 bang. You just work your way through your recipe. And what I want to do next is describe my recipe that I use to do this. It takes the stress out of it. I don't have to figure out new ways of doing it every time. Every time I sit down to do this, I do exactly exactly what I'm about to tell you. So this is what our treatment planning system looks like. And I think most treatment planning systems will look something like this. The images may be in different positions, but we're always gonna have on the, on the top left here, an axial view, and then a coronal view below that, and a sagittal view on the bottom right side of that. And then on the top here, we have the ability to visualize it in three dimensions. I don't typically use this view at all very much. So in general, the goal for me, if I'm sitting down to digitize, and just to be clear, digitizing means we are going to represent electronically where these catheters are inside the patient on the CT scanner. And that will give us the ability to then put sources in there and do the, do the whole treatment planning. And the goal for me, anytime I'm going to digitize anything, so here we have three things to digitize, a tandem and two ovoids. I want the one thing that I'm digitizing to be represented really cleanly in all three of these views. And I'll, I'll get to what that means in just a second. So here's my strategy for doing this. Number one, first step, I always, always start by looking at the axial view. And I'm going to scroll through this axial view up and down with only looking at the tandem. At the moment, I don't care about the ovoids because I'm always going to start digitizing on the tandem. So I'm scrolling through the axial view, watching how this crosshair runs along the tandem. And what I'm really looking for here is especially as we get into the uterus of the patient, there will often see rotations. So if you can see my mouse, we'll often see the tandem come 
and sort of come up like this as we're scrolling through the patient, okay? And if we have this rotation, that's the first thing I'm gonna correct. So if we had a rotation as is being described by my mouse, then I would take the rotating uh, tool and I would rotate the patient this way. I would rotate the patient clockwise until as I was scrolling through, the tandem stayed exactly on this axis the whole time. And I would spend some time making sure that I had that rotation fixed. Okay, once I had in the axial plane, the any rotation in the tandem corrected, then I would move to looking at the coronal plane. And I would do the same thing. I would scroll up and down through the patient, anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior, still only looking at the tandem. I don't even care what the ovoids are doing at the moment. I'm just looking at the tandem. And I'm going to do the same thing. If I see a rotation in this direction, then I would correct it. I would grab the rotate tool and I would move it over and I would get it perfectly straight so that I saw no deviation in how the tandem interacted with this axis as I was scrolling uh, from anterior to posterior, posterior to anterior, back and forth through the patient. So each of these steps is probably taking at this point, if I'm really concentrating and really focusing, each of these points is taking about a minute. So I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm just looking. I haven't done any digitization yet. I'm just setting it up to make it easy for me to digitize. Okay, so I correct any rotations in the coronal plane. And then you probably guess what, what comes next. <clears throat> Now we move to the sagittal plane. And at this point, what you should see in the sagittal plane is a really clean, constant tandem going through the cervix and into the uterus. But I think if I have an image here. No, unfortunately, I don't have that image. I, I should have in here an image of what it would look like if you still needed to do some rotations, but I don't have that in here. In any case, what you're looking at here is sort of, it's very, what's the right word for that? Clean is the only word that comes to mind, but you can sort of tell that you're on the central part of this tandem. If you weren't, then it would sort of start to fade away here, and you would have to scroll through this image in order to see the rest of the tandem. So we don't want that at all. If I did see that here, I would go back to step one and I would start again. I would fix any rotations that happen on the axial plane and then I would go to step two. I would fix any rotations that I see on the coronal plane and then I would come back to the sagittal plane and I want it to look exactly like this. So I don't have to scroll through this image in order to see the entire tandem. I'm just gonna be right dead center down the middle of the tandem. And that's where I wanna be when I'm gonna digitize because that's where the sources are gonna go. If everything looks good here, then I am going to take my digitization tool and I'm gonna to say, okay, here's the tip of the tandem, and then I'm gonna put points all the way down the tandem to describe in the treatment planning system the possible locations of any sources, okay, in the tandem. We always wanna make sure that we digitize well beyond the point where we're gonna have sources, I'm not sure it's the case anymore, but it used to be the case that you could put sources further than you had digitized, which led to some significantly suboptimal treatments or potentially dangerous treatments. And so we always wanna make sure that we're digitizing the catheter and much further than we would ever want to load a source, right? So we know from previous conversations in this presentation, we never wanna load past the flange, but still we're gonna digitize well past the flange just, just to be safe. Okay, so that's how I would digitize the tandem. And now we have an electronic representation of where it will be possible for us to put dwell positions inside the tandem, inside the patient. Okay, and then we're gonna to move to, oh, defining point A. Okay, so since we're in this plane and we have everything set up really perfectly, this is a great time for us to define our point A. Okay, and point A, I think Dan described it, but just to be clear, point A is two centimeters, if you're looking at the central image here, is two centimeters up from the top of the ovoids, which represents the cervical os, and then two centimeters lateral to the, from the tandem. And point A is always staying in the frame of reference of the tandem. So even if the tandem was skewed like this, with respect to the ovoids, we would still put, put it with relative to the tandem. These two centimeters would still come 
from the tandem, not from the central axis. Okay, so while we're here, we can set up our DICOM isocenter here. We could put a two centimeter grid on, and then we could switch over to the coronal image. Again, we haven't moved anything. We're not rotating anything because we really like where we are. And in what we do in our treatment planning system is we actually make a reference line that we call point A. So here would be point A on the right of the patient, and here would be point A on the left of the patient, and it is exactly two centimeters up from the top of the ovoids and two centimeters lateral from the tandem. And that's gonna be our point A. And classically, uh, before we had the ability to sort of visualize this in three dimensions, classically this is where we would prescribe our 100% Isodose line. Any questions about that? So, so far, all we've done is digitize our tandem and set up our point A. We can set up our point A at any time. It's just sort of efficient to do it while you have all of your viewing planes set up perfectly on the tandem because point A is defined with respect to the tandem. So, we could come back later and set it up again, but it would take us longer to do that. Derek, we have two questions. One is from Michael saying, would you say that finding the tip of your tandem depends on your window and level settings? Yeah, this is, a, again, a great point, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It definitely does. I can't demonstrate that in real time, but as you change your window and level settings, you're, you're going to see the tip of your tandem either get longer or get shorter. So one of the things we need to do at the time of commissioning is figure out for our CT scanner and for our general patient anatomy, what window and level gives us an accurate representation of where we're actually going to be delivering. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, I think uh, you're absolutely right. It's uh, as you change your your window level causes your you know t especially since it looks like you're using a metal applicator, it causes that to really bloom and and appear bigger than what it truly is in real in real life. Like dimensionally, it, it might actually grow by, by a, a millimeter or so. And then if you always digitize from the tip of the applicator, uh, you may if, if if that wasn't part of your commissioning process, you may introduce a systematic offset. And as you said, you know, the impact of even a half a millimeter at the close distances that we treat has, has an impact dosimetrically speaking. So good point you made that at point of the time of your commissioning um, efforts, it's important to realize whether you use uh, as an electa land you know lots of folks use plastic applicators and perhaps the extent of those might be somewhat better visible in a ct image uh, than a titanium tandem so it's, it's a good thing to pay attention to yeah definitely something that that we need to be concerned about thanks for that michael mm -hmm. Another question from Deepak, can you please define point A again? Yep, I, I will do that in maybe two, two different ways here. Let me just uh, see if I can close my chat somehow. Okay, so in the coronal view, point A is going to be two centimeters from the top of the ovoids. And this is going to really represent, if everything is set up perfectly, the flange should be right at the top of the ovoids, which is representing the cervical os. We're gonna go two centimeters superiorly. Two centimeters superiorly to that. And then we're gonna go two centimeters. We're still inside the tandem now. So no matter where the tandem is, we're gonna follow the tandem two centimeters up from the top of the ovoids. And then we'll be two centimeters to the left of that and two centimeters to the right of that. So I think we have, if we go back here, this is actually a really good slide for defining point A. So this is looking at it schematically. Again, we're at the top of the ovoids. Typically, we have some sort of flange here as well that we can that can help us localize. And then we're going to go two centimeters up with in in the plane of the tan right, and two centimeters left. The image on the right here is kind of nice because it shows us 
that we always want to stay in the plane of the tandem. So point A is not defined down here. It's not defined up here. It's defined in the plane of the tandem. We can see that quite nicely in our coronal image. Here is part of our tandem running through the plane that we're looking at, and that's where we've defined our point A. Did that help, Deepak? Okay. Deepak says yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, here comes the strategy for, and, and again, I'm just going through this in a great amount of detail because it really is the ex exact process that I use every time I sit down in front of a computer to do this. Okay, so now we have digitized the tandem. We've digitized, uh, sorry, we set up point A, and now uh, we're going to go ahead and digitize the ovoids. So essentially, I use the same strategy here. <clears throat> I'm going to start by looking at the plane. I'm going to be sc scrolling through this axial plane, superior end of the patient, inferior end of the patient, always looking now at the right ovoid. Okay, so we can see here, you can see this sort of cylindrical ovoid portion of the ovoid. This is the plastic that the central catheter is running through. And here we see the central metal, in this case, metal channel of the ovoid. So I'm going to be scrolling through the axial images, and here I'm looking again to fix rotations. So sometimes we see an ovoid that comes uh, into the patient like this. If that was the case, I would grab the image and rotate it until running along this plane, as I was scrolling through this plane, I was always seeing that right ovoid. Same thing again move to the coronal plane, scrolling through the patient from anterior to posterior, and correcting any uh, deviations in rotations that I see here. And then when we move, if we've done both of those things correctly, then when we move to the sagittal plane, we're going to see this really nice, clean image of the ovoid. And then we're here, we can go ahead and digitize that, again, making sure to use whatever window and level uh, we've determined to be accurate uh, at the time of commission. And here we're going to digitize. I'm not sure I have a picture of this. Oh, I do. So we're going to digitize again all the way past the bend in the ovoid. Typically, we're only going to want to use uh, sort of three to four or five positions, depending on uh, which device you're using. But we're never going to want to use 12 positions past the bend in the ovoid as a general rule. But again, for the sake of safety, we will digitize past that. So that, that gives us the ability to visualize where all of our dwell positions uh, are going to be. Okay, so same strategy. Axial image, correct rotations. Coronal image, check rotations. Sagittal image, check if it, everything looks clean. If everything looks clean, we can go ahead uh, and digitize. And of course, as you're doing this, you're probably also every now and again moving back to different views. So I do the axial image, coronal image, sagittal image, and I probably go back to the axial image because I may have changed something in the sagittal image and just make sure that everything is still good. So you don't have, it's not like you can't go back to the axial image and check. Uh, that's just, just a very quick check. Okay, so strategy for digitizing ovoids. I think I just went through that. Uh, sorry, strategy, and then I would do exactly the same thing for the left ovoid here. I would just use exactly the same process, axial image, coronal image, and then sagittal, sagittal, sagittal image, and then I would go ahead and digitize that. Okay, so now that we have our tandem digitized, our two ovoids digitized, we've already defined point A. Now we can go back and roughly set up our views. So again, in the sagittal plane, we can see our full tandem, and then we're going to load our dwell positions. So typically we're going to want to load right to the tip of the tandem and never pass the cervical os, in this case represented by the flange. And we'll just go ahead and put positions in there until we fill up the entire tandem. For the ovoids, we're going to load 1.5 to 3 centimeters of dwell time, depending on the size of the ovoid, and we'll never load, and we're going to typically load right to the tip. In some cases, if the rectum was unfortunately right here and the bladder was very far away on this side, we can consider coming away from the tip 
uh, of the ovoid. But again, this is a call you're going to have to make. Um, just by scrolling through this image, you can sort of see, you want to try and be sort of in the middle between the, as a general rule, in the middle between the rectum and the, and the bladder. So we can get as close as possible to the HRCTV while avoiding those organs. And we don't want to put any dwell positions past the bend here. It's not giving us any um, additional benefit and probably making it difficult for us to avoid um, going over the bladder uh, tolerance doses. And we'll repeat that for the other ovoid. So now we've digitized everything. We've set up our point A. We've put in dwell positions. And now we have to assign times for those dwell positions. So typically what we're going to do here is in the tandem, the top third of the dwell positions, we're going to load 15 seconds. In the bottom two thirds, we're going to load 10 seconds for each position. So each position in the top third gets 15 seconds and each position in the bottom two thirds gets 10 seconds. Okay. And these are sort of, you can think of these in relative times. So if you wanted to load 1.5 seconds and one second, that's completely fine. If you wanted to load 30 seconds and 20 seconds, also completely fine. We're just talking at the moment about uh, relative times. So <laughs> we're going to change that those times based on that point A um, point that we talked about. And here's our loading strategy for the ovoids. <clears throat> so it sort of depends on, or it depends very much on the ovoid size that we use. So if we have small ovoids, we're gonna load two centimeters and our relative time is gonna be somewhere between 10 and 15 seconds. If we have uh, medium ovoids, we're gonna load 2.5 centimeters and we're gonna use 15 to 20 seconds. If we have large ovoids, we're gonna load three centimeters and we'll use a relative dwell time of 20 seconds and so on and so forth. You can see the, the table there. Okay, so now we have, we've defined our dwell positions or locations that it's possible for us to have dwell positions inside the tandem and the ovoids. And now we have also assigned times to each one of those positions. Now we're gonna go ahead and normalize the dose such that the 100% isodose line runs through both point A's. Okay, and that happens differently in different treatment planning systems. So I don't really wanna describe that in too much detail, but every single treatment planning system will have a way to scale the time of each one of those dwell positions such that the 100% isodose line runs through the point A's that we have defined. Okay, so now the ratios of those times are gonna remain the same, but it will no longer be 15 seconds and 10 seconds. It will have changed to, could be, could be anything, 17.3 seconds and whatever the one-third ratio of that is, two-thirds ratio of that is. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so at this point, we're sort of finished our part of the treatment planning as, as physicists, and this is the plan that we're going to call our plan A, I think is the nomenclature we're using in the standardized planning scheme. And sort of 10, 15, 20 years ago, this is the plan that every patient would get. So we, we used point A and we treated every patient to point A because we really, the reason for that is because we didn't know uh, where the cervix actually was or where the, the tumor actually was. And now that we use CT imaging to do this and sometimes MRI imaging to do this, we can start to do a better job of defining the CTV, which you see in red here. So instead of just treating the plan to point A, we can say, hey, listen, we know that we don't have tumor way out to the side here and way out to the side here. So let's bring that dose distribution in a little bit. So we can optimize the dose distribution from the point A plan to what we feel is actually covering just the area that we need to cover. In the same way that it's smaller in this image here, we could also go larger. Typically, point A was very generous, so typically we're going to want to make it smaller. If we have MR imaging as well as CT imaging, then we can do an even better job of optimizing because MRI is gonna allow us to see exactly where the tumor is, know exactly where we want to treat, 
and then we can sort of further optimize that. If we don't have MR imaging and we're only using CT imaging, we can do a little bit of optimization, but we want to be careful that we don't make things too small. Okay, I think I see some questions here. Yes, George asks, is point A still relevant if planning with 3D imaging? Oh, and he oh, yeah. says you answered the question. <laughs> gotcha, yeah, yeah. So I think the, the place to start is always with point A because that's like the cl that's a classic plan that the patient would have got if we didn't have better imaging. So uh, we always want to start with plan A and we're actually going to save that plan. We'll call it plan A and we'll copy it and then we'll make an optimized plan based off of that plan A. The level of optimization is going to depend on the confidence that we have that we know exactly where we want to treat. And that confidence increases if we have MRI and decreases if we don't have MRI. So if we don't have MRI, we're going to do just a little bit of optimization off of plan A. If we have MRI, then we can think about doing um, substantially more optimization. So this is also sort of a good example. I would call this still a pear shape. It's a bit of an odd pear shape. It's a very long tandem, which means we have a very long uh, top part of the pear, but it's still obviously a pear. We don't see any dose dipping down here. Uh, everything is looking, looking pretty good. Okay, so we have a plan. We are obviously going to be looking at this plan with the physician. They're going to say, yes, we would like a little bit more dose here, a little less dose here. We're going to be looking at uh, bladder, rectum, and sigmoid uh, dose tolerances. I don't have it included here, but I think John Eink is going to talk about that in a couple of days. I can also ask, sorry, a couple of weeks. I can also ask Dan Skanderbeg to include that in his presentation next week about tandem and rings because the dose tolerances are the same. And again, we have spreadsheets available to track that and they have, have all of the limits for those as well. So once we're happy with the plan, it meets all of the organ at risk tolerances and it does a, a decent job of covering the HRCTV. Then we're going to say, okay, let's go ahead. We're going to treat this plan. Before we do treat the plan, we need to do a couple of things. One very important thing is to do an independent second check of the dose calculation. So many, many different ways of doing this, many different software tools available for doing this. One really easy way to do this is to take your point A doses and a spreadsheet. I created a spreadsheet here in Google Drive based off of TG43. Again, you can make this yourself or you're more than welcome um, to use this sheet, you just put in the um, coordinates of each one of the dwell positions and it calculates, independently calculates using TG43 what is expecting the doses at uh, point A to be. It's, it's essentially the same uh, spreadsheet as the cylinder uh, second check that we talked about yesterday and I'm happy to share this um, with anybody uh, who's interested. But definitely important that once we have a finished plan, the physician is happy with the plan, then we are definitely going to want to do an independent second check, just as we would do an external beam. It's no different, no different than that. Okay, so this works out. Everybody's happy. Once the tandem and ovoids are inserted, images are acquired, and digitation is complete. Outside of the treatment planning system now, we are going to connect the tandem and ovoids with transfer guide tubes to our HDR unit. And then just like we did for cylinders, and I won't belabor this point, just like we did for cylinders, we're going to want to manually run a dummy wire through each one of those catheters. And that allows us again, just like yesterday, to ensure that we have the correct length and to ensure that the connection between the catheter and the transfer guide tube uh, is secure. Better to know that now than when we try and actually deliver the plan. We're always going to perform a timeout immediately prior to treatment, just like yesterday. At a very minimum, we're going to check the correct patient. We have the correct digitization and connection. So yesterday when we were talking about cylinders, we had one catheter and one transfer guide tube, and one channel. Here we have three channels. So it could be, after you have optimized the plan, that you have different dwell times in the right and left ovoids. So if you get those <laughs> mixed up when you connect to your HDR treatment unit, then of course you deliver the incorrect treatment. 
So you always want to make sure that what you have digitized in the treatment planning system is exactly the same as how you have connected in the, in the real world. Important point here. We want to make sure that we're treating to the correct dose, whatever the physician has prescribed, and we want to make sure that the room is clear. Okay, so just like yesterday, I want to go through a couple of sort of important things to consider. I think we've touched on most of them during the presentation, but they are really important, so I just want to go through them quickly again. What happens, motion is, is a really important thing. Again, we're talking about, you know, sub-millimeter, half a millimeter having a huge impact on, on dose distribution. If we have motion between the time that we have take, acquired the CT images and the time that we treat, then we'd start to get suboptimal plants. Of course, we're going to have some motion. It's unavoidable, but we need to limit that as much as possible for obvious reasons, for all the reasons that we've already talked about here. Once we acquire the CT images, we have no way of knowing at all what the applicator looks like inside the patient relative to the internal anatomy of the patient. So really important as much as possible to limit, uh, to limit motion. You really need to be thinking a lot about it. Connection accuracy, this is what I just described. If you could connect the right ovoid to the left transfer guide tube or vice versa, then you get potentially huge consequences for changes in dose distribution. If you have not optimized your plan and you're just treating a plan, uh, a plan to point A, then it actually doesn't matter, but it would be terrible practice to not think about this every single time uh, you, you did this. I think that's fairly obvious. And that is... That is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? I can, uh, I can definitely share the spreadsheet, Ben. No, no problem at all. Wonderful. You know, thank you so much for this amazing session that you shared. I learned a lot. I think many others on this call learned a lot. Deepak has a question. And Deepak, you can turn on your microphone if you want to just ask it. Deepak's question is, uh, what is the dose frac WRT for external beam radiation? With respect to, sorry. Oh, that is a great question. Ben, do you know what we are advocating for external beam portion of this? Mm, no, I don't think we've uh, sat down to have a consensus. That's right. I think we don't have a consensus on that at the moment, Deepak. The dose fractionation with respect to brachytherapy is going to be eight gray times three fractions. But I don't know that we have a consensus on the external beam fractionation. We'll have to do another curriculum focused on external beam radiation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but you, can, you can certainly... This is Michael. I think you can comment uh, on what we have seen, of course, in the past, uh, doing this for a number of years. And in our clinic, uh, a patient may get uh, radiation to the pelvis, including the lymphatics, and that is often 45 gray in 25 fractions, so at 1.8 gray per day. Uh, sometimes it could be 50 gray in 25 fractions at 2 gray a day. Uh, and sometimes there's a parametrial boost involved. So it, that's at least the order of magnitude you will see, 1.8 or 2 gray a day times 25. And that, of course, feeds into your EQD2 spreadsheet so that you can determine if you treat 8 gray times 3 for a brachytherapy boost or 7 gray times 4, how we it, uh, often do it, that plays into your EQ, EQD2 tolerances for your organs at risk so that's what the spreadsheets are good for, to plug in different numbers, play with them. Of course, when you put in a, an external beam dose to find out what your organ at risk tolerances are for brachytherapy boost treatment, <laughs> then you make, an, you make an assumption that your organs at risk received 100% of that dose from external beam therapy, say 45 gray in 25 treatments. Now, that does not tell you whether or not there was a hotspot in your 
bladder potential or in the rectum, right? So it's good to look at the external beam plan and make sure that your organs at risk did receive, in fact, only 100% or less than that to be safe. One, one other comment I would like to make looking at uh, Derek's sagittal view, the cut through an ovoid here on the screen is, and I don't have ovoids in front of me right now to measure them, but your slide that was talking about, depending on the size, whether it's mini, small, medium, or large ovoids, that you use different loading, or in terms of activating sources, up to three centimeters, make sure you verify that um, if you start loading from the tip and you use a standard five millimeter step size for your sources, and you do load three centimeters, that's seven sources, if I'm not mistaken, that that doesn't take you outside the ovoid, you know, where the bend is, proximally to the afterloader. So the, if your ovoids are, you know, two and a half centimeters long, loading seven sources with a five millimeter step size may take the last source you know, into the bend or in outside your your plastic ovoid, your tissue spacer, and then potentially you're irradiating very close to tissue that wraps around the ovoid and it's close to the to the tandem itself. So it's again part of your commissioning procedure to determine how many sources with what step size, yeah, that's the slide here, uh, that you will load. I don't think I've ever used a th three centimeter loading length because with Electa equipment, I believe that takes you outside the ovoid itself. So, yeah, this, these are all great, great points, Michael. And it is, it is sort of manufacturer dependent, and unfortunately, yeah. there's, no, there's no standardization across that. So, some units will deliver three millimeter step sizes with a three millimeter source. Some will deliver five millimeter step sizes with a five millimeter source. And then again, depending on the manufacturer of the tandem ovoid, can have different lengths of ovoids, different lengths of tandems, so on and so forth. These are all things that um, need to be considered during commissioning for sure. That's right. So don't, don't take this out of context, but always consider that in the context of your specific equipment and hold up a ruler to it. Convince yourself this is long enough and um, I can use that loading. Um, no, thank, you, uh, thank you, Derek, very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. I, I, just a couple more uh, questions. Ben, do we have time or do we have to cut it off? Let's, let's cover these last two questions. So George asks, is it clinically advisable to change ovoid types or sizes or length of tandem in between insertions? And what are its consequences on the total dose after insertion? That is a great question. We will sometimes change the ovoid size or uh, type, yeah, size or type after the first insertion. If we could see that we potentially had had more room and could have used larger ovoids, that would have given us some sort of clinical benefit. And typically, actually, the first insertion is really informative for how we want to do our subsequent insertions. So sometimes if we're really struggling with the rectum dose, we will try as much as possible in the next fraction to set things up to push the rectum out of the field. So there are a bunch of things like that. Maybe we'll think about doing bladder filling if we're struggling with um, bowel dose. So yes, it, 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 I mean, in general, we would prefer to have exactly the same setup each time, but clinically that's not always uh, the best option. The dosimetric impact is very, very difficult to assess because we have uh, different anatomical positions each time. The best we can do is track the hottest 2cc volume for each one of our organs at risk and then make a conservative assumption that those are exactly the same each time, which would be a, a worst case scenario because they almost certainly are not the same each time. Does that make sense, George? 
Great. And then a question from Deepak, the importance of point B, that is a great question. And I know we do talk sometimes about point B. I have not included it here because we pay absolutely no attention to it. What it's representing is the dose to the nodal volumes on the right and left sides of the pelvis. And there are historical reasons for why we would care about point B in the past, but with our ability now to generate 3D external beam plans, and then boost those plans with also image-based HDR. We're less concerned about that during the HDR portion of the treatment delivery. We actually don't consider that at all um, in our clinical evaluation of brachytherapy plans. Um, That's a great point. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, just to add one quick comment there, what Derek just said, I totally agree with him. I think traditionally and historically, point B, the dose to point B was meant to be limited to 25% of the prescribed dose to point A. And as, if, if you have a straight symmetric implant, that's not a problem uh, at all. If once, say if the uterus curves over to one side, either left or right, and you have a pretty skewed implant, because point A stays with your applicator, but point B is anatomic, but anatomy based, then you may have, you know, the right pel pelvic uh, sidewall point B being closer to the applicator and getting a higher dose compared to the, the other side, the, the contralateral side, the left. But I don't think anybody really pays attention to that anymore because we have 3D conformal and IMRT uh, capabilities, generally speaking that really helps us sculpt the dose and not overdose the pelvis from, from external beam. Yeah, I agree with that. Great, Deepak says thank you. And we are past the hour. I think this has been a very productive afternoon and uh, morning for us. So uh, thank everyone so much for joining. Our next session will be next week, Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And we look forward to seeing everyone there. In the meantime, good luck. Make the world a better place. <laughs> and we will see you next time. Ben, thanks so much for organizing these. Great. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.